All right, uh, welcome everybody. Um, today is yet another installment of our uh, Closer Look Journal Club. We're extremely happy to have Valerie Tutwiller um, visiting us from Rutgers University. And uh, today she will be giving us a talk on the rupture of blood clots, mechanics and pathophysiology. Maybe for uh, just a little bit of background, um, Valerie recently started her uh, job after she moved here from um, Penn and Drexel, if uh, I remember correctly. Um, and I've been following her work very closely because she uh, finds a really, really nice balance between doing mechanics as well as really neat imaging. And then looking at a really complicated problem with this, which is that of fracture of a very soft uh, material. And so I'm personally very, very <laughs> happy that she's here and he's, she's gonna show us some of her work. And uh, I also wanna thank my uh, co-organizers, A, for being here and B, for of course, always helping and supporting this effort that's growing and growing over time. Um, and that would be uh, Johannes Weikenmeier uh, out of Stevens Institute of Technology. Um, it would be Matt Bercy out of uh, Wussel, uh, Washington University, St. Louis, Emma Lejeune uh, from Boston University and Adrian Buganza out of Purdue. Um, yeah, I think with that being said, I want to remind also everybody we have a weekly um, journal club, so stay tuned, check out our videos of the past, and uh, yeah, I'll hand over the virtual microphone to uh, Valerie. Great, well, thank you. Um, hi, everybody. I'm excited to be here to share uh, some of our work with you, and uh, thank you to the organizers for inviting me to give this presentation. Um, so as Manuel said, I'm currently at Rutgers, but the work that I'm going to present today was part of my postdoc, so it was done at the University of Pennsylvania, where I was a postdoc in John Weissel's lab. So, one of the biggest motivating factors behind a lot of our work is that cardiovascular diseases are the leading causes of death worldwide. So this can be things such as heart attacks or strokes. And we wanna better understand the mechanisms that underlie the pathogenesis of these diseases with the ultimate goals of seeing if we can develop uh, better therapeutics or treatments or diagnostic tools uh, for some of these conditions. But specifically, we look at them from a blood clotting focus. So if you get a cut, right, you want your blood to clot because you want to stop bleeding. And so this happens through a process called hemostasis. However, this process sits on a very fine balance where on one hand, if you have too much uh, breakdown of the clot or resolution through a process called fibrinolysis, or if you don't have enough clot formation, coagulation, then you can get bleeding conditions. So this can happen genetically through hemophilia, a hemorrhagic stroke, or even following traumatic injury. On the other hand, if you have too much clot formation or not enough breakdown of the clot, then you can get thrombotic conditions such as heart attacks, ischemic strokes, or venous thromboembolisms. And so this is the area where my uh, presentation today will focus. However, currently we are working on both bleeding and thrombosis in the lab. So to give you a little bit of uh, background about um, the constituent components that make up blood clots, uh, blood clots are made up of a mixture of cells. So for example, you have red blood cells, which are thought to be fairly passive players in the blood clotting process, but they do make up about half the volume of the blood clot and can definitely potentially influence some of the things that we look at in the lab. You have platelets, which are very small and nucleate cells that are responsible for blood clotting and can interact um, with the, the fibrin component of the clot, which is this viscoelastic uh, matrix that you can see here. And so it's a polymeric ma matrix that kind of acts as the net that holds all of the cells together. Then you also have white blood cells that are present in, it, present in clots as well. Um, which can play a role in, in blood clotting, but of course are, are more famous for their roles in uh, immunity and inflammation. So uh, with a little bit of the background on, on the components that make up a blood clot, the presentation today will focus on this fibrin component. So fibrin is the major mechanical and structural component of the blood clots. Again, you can see that fibrin component here in blue. Um, and so it's what holds together all of the different cellular 
components. So the fiber network is made up of fibrinogen, which is a blood plasma protein. Uh, and so these fibrinogen monomers become cleaved um, and polymerize into a polymeric network uh, that is ultimately cross-linked with factor 13A, which provides a lot of the, the mechanical stability to the clot. So previous studies have shown by looking at plasma clots, which contain only fibrin, clots that contain fibrin uh, plus those platelets and whole blood clots, which have all of the components. So your, your fibrin, your platelets and your red cells. Uh, and by looking at the viscoelastic mechanical properties of each one of these different types of blood clots, uh, the um, authors were able to determine that fibrin uh, through by looking at the plasma clots, uh, really are the, the underlying scaffold of the mechanical properties and account for much of the mechanical properties of the clot, uh, which for us is one of the motivating factors going forward and focusing, at least initially, our mechanical studies on the fibrin network or the plasma component of the blood. So, uh, now that we know what blood clots are, it's important to think about why we want to study the mechanical properties of the blood clots or of thrombi. So first and foremost, fibrin is a viscoelastic material. And many of the studies that have focused on understanding the mechanics of blood clots or of fibrin have focused on looking at the viscoelastic mechanical properties. Um, it's important to note that patients that have bleeding or thrombotic conditions often have altered mechanical properties of their blood clots or of their, their fibrin alone. Again, this is often looked at through from a viscoelastic lens. Mechanical properties are able to determine some of the clinical outcomes in these patients. For example, potentially whether or not embolization of a thrombus would occur. And so this is one of the main motivating factors behind the study that I'm going to talk about today. But it's also important to consider that many treatments uh, or the effectiveness or the response of many uh, treatments are going to be determined or influenced by the clot's mechanical properties. Uh, fibrin also has many other uh, potential clinical uses, such as in tissue engineering or uh, tissue regeneration, or as fibrin sealants that are used in wound healing or traumatic injuries as well. So collectively, all of this provides reasons for the importance of studying mechanical properties of blood clots and thrombi. So uh, as I noted on the previous slide, most of the studies that have been done on fibrin have looked at the, the viscoelastic mechanical properties or the stiffness, the ability for a material to resist deformation under an applied load. But if we wanna understand what drives the embolization or the breaking apart of a thrombus, then we want to look at a different property or the strength of the material, the ability to withstand an applied load without rupture. And so here you can see an example of three different materials. You have a rubber tire, wood, and glass. You can see that they're lined up in order of increasing stiffness. But what's important to note is that stiffness does not always correlate with the strength of the material. As you can see here, looking at what the strength is compared to that increasing stiffness. And thus, the viscoelastic mechanical measurements that have been taken on blood clots don't necessarily inform the ability of that blood clot to resist breaking apart. And so we can turn back to the biology to get a little bit of a deeper understanding of why we want to understand why a blood clot or how a blood clot might resist breaking apart. So in the case of venous thromboembolism, where you can get a blood clot in your leg, so it can form, this is called a deep vein thrombosis, and then if a portion of that clot or thrombus breaks off, it can travel to your lung called a pulmonary embolism. And this can result in a 30% increase in the mortality rate. So this can happen in the venous system, but it can also happen in the arterial system in the case of ischemic strokes, which can break apart from a cardiac thrombus. <clears throat> 
So there is a strong clinical motivation for understanding why some blood clots or thrombi break apart and others don't. And so we can think about it in terms of looking at a, a thrombus that is protruding into a blood vessel that's being exposed to those blood shear forces, as well as other forces, such as muscle contraction or the platelets pulling on that fiber network. So if you have a defect in the surface of your thrombus, then you'll get forces going across that defect. And then we can think about that that thrombus embolizing would be akin to a material fracturing or breaking. And so to better understand this process, uh, we turn back to some classical fracture mechanics techniques. And so here we're using a mode one fracture assay where we have a, a single edge notch in the sample. And so if we look at how the uh, length of that notch, so with respect to the width of the sample influences the fracture process, then we can start to learn some more about the fracture toughness of the material. And specifically, if this is a material property, right? We want to understand if the uh, toughness of a blood clot is independent of the size or the shape of the sample. And so to do this, we can look at different crack lengths. But here, I'll show you a video of, the, um, uh, of what our, our assay looks like where we're looking at the rupture process. So you can see, we, this is a plasma blood clot and we're loading in the tensile direction or the vertical direction seen here. You can see that in the beginning, the material on a macroscopic scale isn't changing very much. The crack is widening in the direction of tension, but it's not really growing in that perpendicular direction. Up until the point where we reach this critical point, and then it's the crack starts to travel very rapidly across the sample and ultimately results in the breaking of the sample. So we're able to track the, the stress or the strain or the force of the displacement um, by taking these mechanical measurements. And then we also take uh, macroscopic videos to be able to look at and to correlate between what's happening visually to the rupture of the clot with these mechanical measurements. And so um, we're then able to take this data and this information and uh, extract some different uh, information about the mechanical properties. So again, if we look at the force, which can be seen here on the Y ordinate versus the strain on the X ordinate, we're able to look at that uh, fracture curve, just like we saw on the previous slide. And so we can see that uh, the, the force initially increases, right? It then uh, plateaus and starts to decrease. And so if we want to look at the toughness of the material or the ability of the material to absorb energy and deform without rupture, then we're going to look at the point, the part of this curve that starts from our zero point up until our maximum force and use this to calculate the critical energy release rate or the rate at which energy is dissipated to create a new fracture area. Um, and so we're able to take first this experimental data and extract this information, uh, which was done in collaboration with John Bassani at the University of Pennsylvania. So one of the first uh, observations that we wanted to make and that, that's important to note is that if we look at these force displacement curves in a fibrin gel that is uh, made without any cracks or defects being inserted, you can see that the mechanical properties, which are shown in the gray curve here, are uh, significantly stronger than the mechanical properties of the black curves, regardless of the crack length that we're putting into these curves, right? Which tells us that fibrin is mechanically weak in the presence of a defect. And so again, turning back to the biology, this is important to consider because defects are going to occur in blood clots. So you probably were able to notice from the images that I've been showing that blood clots are not homogenous, right? There are mixtures of cells and a fibrin 
even within the fiber network, there, there are holes within the fiber network just due to the nature of the polymerization of these clots. So and this is a clot that's formed in vitro. When the clots are formed in, in vivo, you're going to get uh, even more heterogeneity within the, in the thrombi because they're forming over the course of time. They're forming in layers that are alternating between fibrin and red cells or the forces are influencing the polymerization of the fibrin. So that's one way that, that defects could occur in blood clots. Another is that uh, during the coagulation process, fibrin is going to start to be enzymatically degraded. And so as fibrin is degraded, it's going to cut up that, the, that fibrin network, and you're going to start to get the formation of edges or holes within your fibrin network. And so that could also potentially influence propensity for a person to have a thrombus that breaks compared to another person whose thrombus might not embolize or break apart. Um, so it is uh, very important to understand how blood clots are going to behave in the presence of defects using these fracture mechanic techniques. So importantly, our findings show that the fracture toughness is in fact a material property. And so we were able to do this by taking those same samples that I showed in the video earlier and having crack lengths that varied uh, in their, their length or the uh, fraction of the width of the sample. So by, uh, by looking at the toughness that was calculated from each individual curve uh, as a function of the crack length, we were able to see that there was no uh, difference or trend across the increasing crack lengths, meaning that the size of the crack did not influence the toughness of the material. And this is important because it means that it, if, if it is a material property, then it is independent of the size or of the shape of the material. And thus information that we get from these in vitro experiments can ultimately be used to help provide insights into in vivo clot behavior and thus help to explain the embolization mechanisms. So we wanted to look at some of the structural changes that are happening in the clot to get a little bit of a better understanding of what is driving this rupture process. So to do this, we took confocal microscopy images of areas uh, in the region immediately ahead of the crack tip and those that were further removed from the crack tip. So here you can see the images that were removed at 0% strain and 40% strain. And then here you can see images that are immediately ahead of the crack tip. And so first we saw that there is fiber alignment that happens in the uh, region that is immediately ahead of the crack tip. So here you can see that uh, in the area immediately ahead of the crack tip, we get increasing alignment expressed as the order parameter with increasing amounts of strain. This does not happen at the areas removed from the crack tip. We see that there is some degree of strain, but at the low levels of strain that we're looking at, we don't see um, alignment removed from the crack tip. We're also able to look at a larger range of strains in samples uh, that were uh, examined with scanning electron microscopy. And again, we see that as we increase the amount of strain, we do get uh, increased alignment of the fiber and fibers. So that can help to inform uh, the mechanism of what is happening in terms of the rupture process. Uh, we also note that there is densification of the fiber and fibers ahead of the crack tip. So we're able to look at this densification again in these same confocal images uh, through two different analysis methods. One, we see that there is an increase in the mean fluorescence intensity under increasing strain compared to both regions far removed from the crack tip and those that are not under strain. Um, showing that there's an increase in that fiber and density. In addition, we're able to look at the pore sizes within the fiber network. And if we look at the ratio of the pore height to the pore width, we see that that changes as we increase the amount of strain on the sample. Again, pointing to a change in the, in the structure of the clot where the fibers start to come closer together, uh, resulting in their densification.
using scanning electron microscopy, we're able to see the same phenomenon with the bundling or densification of fibers under strain. Here you can see that the fibers are further apart, whereas here under stretch samples, you can see that not only are they aligning, but they're coming closer together. We're also able to use transmission electron microscopy where we can look um, and, and see the alignment of fibers here in unstretched samples and here in stretched samples. We can see alignment of fiber fibers and the increasing of the diameter of these fibrin fibers showing the bundling of the fibrin fibers under strain. So uh, that helps to tell us some about the structural changes that are happening. Um, so we now have a macro scale experimental approach. We have a micro scale um, experimental approach looking at the microstructure. And then lastly, uh, we're using a modeling approach, a finite element model to look at the fiber network under strain, which was done in collaboration with Prashant Purohit uh, at the University of Pennsylvania. And so, um, he worked to develop a, a model of the fibrin network that looks at the uh, uh, properties of the, the fibrin network, the strain stiffening properties of, an in, of the incompressible fibrin network, coupled with the molecular unfolding that occurs within the fibrin network as the sample is strained, and then the interaction between the solid and the liquid phase seen through the osmotic pressure, the expulsion of the, the uh, serum from the clot or the plasma from the, the clot um, that uh, while the fibrin is being stretched. And so uh, just like the experimental results, the theoretical approach is able to output these force and displacement curves based on our uh, um, experimental clots that we're making. And so when we look at the comparison of the experimental with the finite element model, we're able to do a visual comparison, such as can be seen here, where we see increasing dis, uh, displacements resulting in that macroscopic deformation of the gel. And we're able to see that we see a similar effect uh, in the finite element model. If we overlay these force displacement curves, we can see that the experimental curve is in black and the theoretical curve is in red. And you see that we have a good alignment between experiment and theory. So if we look at the results from the uh, finite element modeling, we see that just like in our experimental results, there is fiber alignment uh, right ahead of the region of the crack tip that is seen in red here as being the most aligned portion of the sample. Now, the model is able to take it a little bit further than we were experimentally and get a little bit deeper into some of the mechanisms. So it's able to show us uh, that there, where there would be molecular unfolding, again, with most of the unfolding happening in those red and orange regions immediately ahead of the crack tip. It's able to output the strain as a function of the distance from the crack tip uh, with respect to different crack lengths represented here as A. And as you can see, that function of strain to distance from the crack tip overlays between all of the samples um, with different crack lengths. Again, pointing to the fact that this is a material property of the fibrin network. And ultimately, the model shows us that when the rupture process happens, it happens at a critical strain ahead of the, the crack tip that is independent of the crack length. And importantly, this points to the mechanism of rupture, that is a critical fracture strain that, that's driving the process and not, say, diffuse damage that's happening to the clock. And importantly, this maps to the rupture of individual fibrin fibers that have been shown by other researchers as well. Uh, so pointing again to, to what the mechanism of, of fracture is. Now, importantly, we can turn back and think about how this model can then inform some biological implications and some of the findings um, that were presented in this manuscript. So importantly, we're focusing on the, the plasma component, but of course there are blood cells that are present uh, in the uh, blood typically, right? And so we were able to do some preliminary experiments and some modeling um, where we see the plasma curves like the one that I presented here shown in black. And we did uh, 
uh, curves rupture process on whole blood, which can be seen experimentally in red. And so then if we take the model and we um, normalize it to the amount of plasma or fiber that would be present in that whole blood clot, we see that there is good overlap between the plasma force from the model that's generated in our whole blood curves. So again, pointing to the fact that fibrin is that main mechanical component of the clot um, and what's accounting for much of the rupture process, which is important again for our experiments and for understanding the biological methods, but also for potentially informing uh, the, the embolization process of thrombi, which are inherently more complex. Um, we're also able to consider what would happen if the density of the fibrin network would vary um, because patients with thrombotic conditions have an increased uh, fibrinogen concentration, which means that in turn, they likely have an increased fibrin density in their clots or thrombi um, in comparison to a healthy subject. So again, by uh, changing the the volume fraction of fibrin in the model, we're able to see that increasing the fibrin density would result in an increased toughness, which again can help to have some uh, potential clinical implications. So in conclusion, in this paper, we were able to examine the fracture mechanics of fibrin gels, and this can be used to inform the mechanistic basis of embolization. We were able to calculate the critical energy release rate from experimental curves and then compare them to a theory, uh, to a theoretical model and determine that the theoretical model is a good approximation for what we're seeing experimentally. Uh, we determined that the mechanism of rupture is a critical stretch that occurs ahead of the crack tip. And then ultimately, um, in future work, we can um, potentially use this new uh, knowledge to help develop rupture resistant fiber based hydrogels um, or to inform better treatments for, um, throm uh, for thrombosis or embolization as well. So in this uh, manuscript and, and presentation, we talked about everything that happens from the the initiation of tension up until that maximum force in terms of the toughness portion of this rupture process. Um, but if you're wondering what happens after that maximum force is reached, uh, then I encourage you to look at our uh, recent paper that was published just earlier this month that focuses on the rupture portion of this process or what's happening after the maximum force is reached to get a little bit of a deeper understanding of the rupture of blood clots and fibrin in particular. Um, so again, this was largely done in my postdoc lab, but just to tell you a little bit about uh, the lab that uh, we started a year ago at, at Rutgers, we are still studying fibrin and blood clot mechanics, and we're coupling this with studies of blood clot structure uh, and blood clot resolution and seeing how they all feed and interplay with each other. Um, and so then, yeah, in conclusion, I would just like uh, to thank everybody in the Weissel lab, especially uh, John and Rustem who were involved in these studies, and then uh, Prashant Jaspreet and John Bassani at uh, the University of Pennsylvania as well. And I am happy to uh, take any questions. Uh, that was fantastic work. And I can say that from the perspective of somebody who's like, you know, always two steps behind you. Um, as you know, we also study uh, blood clot mechanics and it's um, just impressive to see the amount of work you've done there. Um, yeah, maybe we'll start out with, with questions that the audience may have, and then um, we can move on from there to sort of more directed questions. Anybody yeah. curious about any aspects of this work, any um, urgent uh, answers you're seeking? Your presentation must have been incredibly clear, I guess. <laughs> um, I, I have a brief question. Um, I was wondering for the, the finite element implementation, um, you mentioned a Neohookian material, and then um, there was basically like an additional component um, involved in that, that they captured like the mechanics of the fiber network. Um, could you talk a little bit more about that perhaps? Um, like, it, in the um, results that you showed, did it have um, fibers rupturing or um, was was the finite element simulation um, not for any rupture occurring? 
Yeah, so this is looking at, at rupture. So there, there is a crack and then ultimately the fibers are rupturing or, or breaking under a certain um, strain. And so that's how we determined, right, that there was a critical strain that was happening in the region ahead of the, the crack tip, which was causing the, the propagation of the crack. Um, and so that's also something that we look at a little bit more in that uh, follow-up manuscript that I mentioned at the end of my presentation, where we start to look at the physical rupture, right? So this, this paper focused on the, the onset of rupture, right? When it was just starting to happen, um, but that follow-up paper is looking at the physical breaking of the fiber and fibers. And so there we were able to see that the fibers actually uh, break in a cooperative manner, right? So based on the amount of a force that's being placed on each individual fiber, once that initial force is reached in that first fiber and it's enough to break it, then they start to break cooperatively because then there are fewer fibers. So the amount of force on the remaining fibers becomes increasing, right? And that's why it looks like almost like a zipper unzipping yeah. across the plot as it breaks. Very cool. Okay. So yeah, in the work that you presented today, there isn't like um, breaking of finite elements or or that that's in the subsequent manuscript. Correct. Yes. Okay, cool. I'll definitely take a look at that because that sounds really fascinating. Thank you. Mm -hmm. I have a quick question. Sure. Um, what, what are the units of toughness in some of your, your slides? So I'm curious how does this compare with other materials, for example? Uh, yeah, so, so this is a, a, this material has a relatively low toughness, right? So, so hydrogels could have say one to a thousand, right? And we're looking at something along the lines of like eight to 10. So it's definitely a low it toughness material. Um, which is interesting to consider because, right, one of the, the main physiological functions of blood clots is that they have to experience and withstand a lot of different forces, right, to prevent bleeding to come, you know, of the blood coming out of the blood vessel. So it's definitely intriguing that they're relatively low material, especially for such an extensible material. Sounds good. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Um, I have a question. Have you, and, and this is, I think, the most technical question that I'll, <laughs> that I'll ask because I know that I'm one. Oh, actually, let me ask uh, uh, Yifan to ask his question. I don't want to discourage um, other question askers. Yifan, all you. Uh, yeah, hi, Marilyn. Very nice talk. And I have a question about the uh, molecular unfolding model. And I'm wondering, are you using uh, the HM model for that one? Uh, so again, this this falls a little bit more into um, the the second follow up paper that that is looking that looks at the the unfolding a little bit more. Um, whereas here, and I think that that is is also a very interesting area of work to pursue in the future. Uh, there's some work that's been done that, that, of course, that looks at the molecular unfolding of individual fibrin fibers under increasing amounts of strain. Um, and, but I think that understanding which regions of the, the fibrin fiber uh, are unfolding at which points of strain, right, is definitely an area that, that could be considered in more detail, both from a modeling and from an experimental standpoint. Okay, thank you. Um, quick question. I'm, I'm not sure you saw the work um, on um, hydrogel fracture overall that, that sort of investigates these critical time uh, length scales of, you know, the, um, the elastic zone or plastic zone. Um, and then there was some really nice work um, being done on actually blood clot um, fairly recently it just got accepted in extreme mechanics letters. Um, do you know which paper I'm talking about? Um, I'm not sure. I, I think, but I'm but I'm not 100 percent sure if it's the same one that um, you're talking about. But yeah, I was wondering whether you had all tried to estimate the, these length scales according to um, these formulas that are presented therein, and and how that related to your work comparison. Um, yes, yeah, so I'm not sure of the answer to that question, but I would love to look at the the paper that you're referring to, and then see if we could do something like that with our our results. 
Perfect. Uh, I'll actually put it in the chat real quick, ah, and maybe okay. we can exchange afterwards. I'd be just curious to see how well uh, your measurements align with theirs. Yeah. I'll Anyways, um, any other questions? I have a quick question. Um, basically, I'm curious about this threshold for crack propagation to occur. So mm -hmm. in your experiment, you kind of initiate the crack yourself, and then, the, and then as you pull, you see this propagation. Correct. So I'm curious about how this uh, happens in vivo. So for example, if you have a clot that's sitting in a vessel, let's say, do you expect that normal shear forces from blood would ever reach this threshold that you've identified in vitro or ex vivo? Yes. So, so the shear forces could potentially um, reach this threshold uh, in large part due to the, the inclusivity of a thrombus, right? How much is protruding into the blood vessel can result in large increases in shear forces. And there was one microfluidic study done in the Diamond Lab um, at the University of Pennsylvania that can that looks at some of the, the shear forces that are needed to cause the, the rupture. Um, and uh, they were fairly similar to the to the amount of force that we were seeing needed um, to break the, the, the fibrin network. So I think that in that sense, it is a um, uh, physiologically or pathologically relevant uh, process and test setup. Um, but it's important to note again that, that in, in our studies, right, we do have that, that presence of a defect. Um, and thinking about where you would see defects like that in a thrombotic setting, right? And so if, as I pointed out, in the case of, of non-uniformity in, in blood clots um, or in the case of, of fibrinolysis. And so that would even lower the threshold than what they saw in the, in the Diamond Lab manuscript as well. Um, so I think that, that by combining some of these structural studies with the mechanical studies, we're able to, to get at answering that question in a little bit more detail. Um, and if we look at what happens in the case of embolization in, in patients, right, whether they're, they're looked at um, through, through autopsies or through, uh, through emboli that are extracted, uh, it's been noted that the most of the failure or the points of embolization are occurring through cohesive failure. So similar to what we're seeing here, where the fiber network is breaking apart, which is, again, a kind of pointing from a clinical standpoint to the uh, potential and the importance of, of these types of studies where you would see forces high enough to break the fiber network apart. Thanks. Mm -hmm. um, are there any other questions? Um, Valerie, I, I think we, we sent you an email and kind of prepared you that we also like to tie in sort of additional discussions that may be informational to, to young faculty as well as graduate students. And, one of the things that I was curious uh, asking you was um, how you balance sort of the interdisciplinary nature of your work, right? I mean, interdisciplinarity is something we always talk about, but your work is just so closely representing that idea of being between engineering and medicine. Um, and being in a similar boat, I always struggle, do I tailor my work toward clinical journals or engineering journals, toward clinical conferences or engineering conferences? So I'm wondering, um, how how you sort of strike that balance and, and what goes through your mind as you decide on journals and conferences? Yeah, so I think that this is is always a challenge, right? And the the interdisciplinary research and taking a multidisciplinary approach is something that's been very important to me through graduate school, through my postdoc, and now as I'm starting my own lab. And so one of the ways that, that I go about doing this is by having some really great collaborators that can help to make sure that you know we're really driving at a clinically relevant question by working directly with clinicians and, and vice versa by collaborating with people in mechanical engineering that use these techniques or these models on other materials to make sure that that we're interpreting our results um, in the correct way. And so I think definitely building strong collaborations has been uh, an important part uh, for me at getting at this multi multidisciplinary type of an approach. And I think in terms of what conferences or, or what journals to go to, to go more clinical or more engineering, you know, I, I, I try to walk a balance between both, right? By, between sharing our result, results in both types of settings. And again, depending a little bit on the, the focus of the study. Um, 
here we're taking a, a very mechanical approach to a clinical question. So we were largely targeting more um, mechanical or biomaterials types of, of journals and conferences. Um, but on the flip side, if we take a little bit more of a, a structural and translating this into what's happening in embolization, it could easily be flipped into the clinical side. Um, so just by kind of combining both of those into one story, you know, we, we we try to go to and present and publish in both types of journals, but it is definitely hard to uh, decide, you know, which one is right for the particular uh, experiments and story that we're telling. Um, definitely try to do a little of both. Yeah, yeah, I really hear you in that. Uh, and um, I, looking at your work, obviously you're publishing in very high impact journals that I think sort of reach both audiences. Um, and so I think that makes it sometimes a little easier. I feel like it kind of converges, um, the readership converges, the higher impact journal you reach. But um, yeah, it's it's definitely a challenge that I and my students look at a lot of times. The engineering yeah. community probably appreciates it more, but I also want to know the clinic community probably doesn't read the engineering journal. So um, I think that's always uh, a sort of an iterative process that we all go through. Yeah. And I think if it is something that, that you're ultimately aiming to publish in an engineering journal, right, then making sure you're presenting it in a clinical setting is always helpful because then it is still reaching both audiences to some degree, at least. Yeah, I wonder whether, um, Matt, for example, you struggle probably similarly, right, in that some of your work is very, very sort of non-classic engineering, yet you do have an engineering yeah. background and training. Yeah, you know, I'm in, in the mechanical engineering department here, but, you know, we, we are more on the mechanobiology side of mechanical engineering and to some extent even more on the biology side of mechanobiology. So we do find ourselves uh, sometimes in, in that very similar situation. But I think your, your point is well taken. You, know, you, you kind of have to, to some extent, tailor the results and your findings to both of these communities, whether or not the main focus is an engineering journal or a, a clinical type journal. Um, but yes, I, I agree. It is a uh, sometimes difficult to yeah. balance the two. Yeah. Um, Valerie, also, um, you know, one of the objectives we have is to, to kind of precise, like provide insight that maybe may not be um, presented in a paper necessarily. Um, and, you know, I'm not asking you to bring the skeletons out of the closet, I guess, but I'm always curious, you know, what we don't see in the paper is like, what were sort of like the unexpected challenges in this project? Now, what would you look back at and be like, that was hard. And I'd like others to know of those being challenges that they not, you know, face themselves alone. Yeah, well, I'm sure sure that you know, Manuel, from having worked with, with blood clots, um, but just technically these, these experiments were difficult. They require a large amount of blood um, and very delicate handling to be able to, to move and to set up a lot of these different experiments. Um, and so that was definitely a, a, a hurdle that, that we had to overcome, making sure that, you know, while we were trying to apply the, some of these classical techniques that are, are using typically done on, you know, metals or rubbers or those sorts of things to a very soft biological material that inherently has a lot of variability. You know, it, 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 there were definitely technically challenging experiments that took a lot of trial and error in the beginning to get an experimental set up and molds and, and everything designed that would work well for our samples. That's helpful to hear and, uh, you know, to, to be validated. <laughs> um, so if you look back, um, you know, and obviously you did a wonderful job, I'm not implying that you didn't, but like if you had to do things differently, um, what would you what would you do differently now that you have the knowledge and the privilege of having done it once? <laughs> um, I think I probably would have tried to do some more structural studies with the, the samples. So, so we ended up going back and doing um, confocal studies on our samples, but I think it would have been really nice to have tried to extract some of the, the macroscopic samples, right, while we were stretching them at different points and taking those out and being able to look at the imaging at various stages of this, this rupture process in a little bit more detail to get at a little bit more of the, the microstructural mechanisms 
Yeah, I um, I can see that. Um, I, I I find it always a little painful, you know. And, and I finish a project, it's like, oh, had we known this, yeah. you know, I would have done yeah. all this differently. So I, I almost wish there was a section in each paper. That's yeah, exactly. You know, that as well. Yeah, yeah. but we didn't know we're thinking. Yeah. Yeah. Curious. Anybody else have questions related to any of these topics? Uh, especially maybe my students that struggle every day with handling plot plot. I wonder whether they. Uh, Want to use the opportunity to learn a trick or two? Um, yeah, I I have more of like a, a philosophical question, I guess. Um, how do you think that these experiments will be influenced by like adding in other components of blood clots, specifically like platelets? Yeah, so I think that's a, a great question and and one that that we're definitely interested in considering because right blood clots that are forming in the body are of course going to have all of these other components. Um, and so I showed um, some of the, the preliminary work, right, with, with red blood cells or, or whole blood being present and that it maps fairly well, right? That those, those fibrin, uh, the fibrin component is the major mechanical component of the clot. But as you start to add in red cells, right, they're gonna change the fiber network structure. So I think that all of these things could potentially influence the process. And if we look at the platelets, right, they can generate forces on their own and interact with the fiber network, pull in the fiber network. So then it starts to have the question of how is a, a network that has some inherent tension present going to, you know, are influence the rupture process? Is it going to make it tougher or less tough? Um, and so I think these are really important things to start to get at and to answer as we go forward right into, into better understanding mechanisms of, of embolization. Um, and then of course, how just the, the properties of blood and of thrombi differ between healthy subjects and those that develop thrombotic conditions or even between different types of thrombotic conditions, right? Um, because while they might all result in, in thrombi, there, there are definitely differences. So I think it, it, that's definitely a great question and, and one that you know, I hope many of us are working on in, in the future as years go forward to get at this question. Thank awesome. you. Yeah, I think it's very interesting to kind of consider, especially like your work um, on characterizing the different uh, explanted thrombi and how like the, the organization of the constituents changes like that is definitely something that's a little intimidating to think about replicating experimentally. Right. Yeah. There are definitely a lot of things that can happen in in an in vivo system, which is why we're kind of started by taking it it a little bit more straightforward, right, and not trying to immediately replicate what's happening in thrombi because that would make the interpretation of the results both from an experimental standpoint, an analytical standpoint, and from a modeling standpoint significantly more complex, right? And so in order to be able to understand on the large scale how all of the components and then all of the structural organization of those components ultimately influences the rupture process, I think it is important to build in in those elements as we go forward. Valerie, really appreciate uh, you taking the time and um, you know giving this presentation in the first place and also subjecting yourself to our uh, direct and somewhat indirect questions. Um, unless anybody has another question, um, I would uh, just wanna thank Valerie one more time for um, being here and you know giving us a closer look. And um, other than that, yeah, I would just uh, also thank everybody for being here. Yeah, thank you for having me. Yeah, thank you so much for doing this. This is really cool. Great. I'll stop the recording.